Okay, good morning, everyone. Um, today we're learning Shabbat Daf Kaf, uh, Kaf Aleph. Today's shir is dedicated by Tova Tarragon in memory of her father, Rabbi Jerome Fisher, or Rabbi Yirmiyar Bar Yaakov Yosef, Sichrono Lebracha, who taught his granddaughter Esther Korman Gemara at a young age and would be thrilled that his daughter is now learning Gemara. And also by Sandra Rubin in honor of her aunt Alba Rubin's 81st birthday, Abnei Aviestri and Mazalto. Okay. Um, today we're starting on Daf Kaf, uh, Kaf Amibet at the bottom. We were, if you remember, yesterday we started with Babem Malikin. We started with all the types of wicks that one could use or not use for, um, for lighting candles on Shabbat. And we started with wicks, then we moved to um, oils, what kind of oils people can use or what kind of things one can use to burn the oil, to burn the candles. So now it says at the very bottom, um, Amarami Bar Abin, the last line. Okay, the last thing we were talking about was Sha'ava. And we said they needed to teach you that, if you remember, the first half was the all the um, for wicks, and then the second part of the Mishnah was for the um, for the camp, for the oil. So now they were talking about Sha'ava and they said we specifically needed to tell you that because you might have thought that wax we were talking about for wicks. Actually, it could be used for wicks. It just can't be used for lighting. So now Amarami Bar'avin. Itrana Psulta. Okay, now they're talking about something else. They're just defining again terms. The Itran is, is the psolet, Psulta de Zifta. It's the, the bad part of the pitch. So like when you warm, when you heat it, there's this sediment in there or some sort of thing that separates from it. That's itan, which we're going to get to later. Sha'ava, the reason why they brought this is because this statement included both the itran and the sha'ava. Sha'ava psulta didvasha, didvusha. Okay, the sha'ava, the, the wax, is really, where does it come from? Or if you ever went to one of these bee farms? So it comes from what's left over from the beehive when, the, when the, they make the honey from the honeycomb. So the leftovers, that's what they use for the wax. Lamai nafkamina. Okay, so now they say, so why are you telling us this? What's the relevance? They say, lamekachumemka. This reminds us of the story of Abaye, that they were teaching them things that were going to be useful for them in the business world, right? Or when you go out on the, in the shuk and you go buy something, this is important to know. So what is it? It's if you go and you buy, what's the relevance? If you say, I'm going to, I want to buy from you wax, and then what they give you is the end of the beehive, you know, after, sorry, the, um, the honeycomb. They give you the honeycomb itself. Instead of giving you the wax and it's, you know, the way you would normally buy wax, um, they do it in the, in the, um, I see someone said their Zoom keeps freezing. Someone having issues? No? Okay. So um, in terms of the wax, they, if they give you a beehive, uh, sorry, I keep saying the wrong word. If they give you the, the honeycomb, then you can't complain and say, you know, sorry, that's not what I ordered, because that really is, okay? So basically, for the purposes of selling, that's, that's going to be the same thing, basically. Tanu Rabbanan. Kol elu shamru ema likim ahem shabbat, aval osim mehem medura, bein litchamem kenegda, bein lishtamesh laora, bein al gabe karka, bein al gabe kira. Okay, so all these things that they say you can't use for lighting on Shabbat, there are certain things you can do with them before Shabbat. Remember, we talked about lighting a fire. Now, all these other issues would be an issue of Shema Yachted, that you might end up stoking the coals. So basically, they say, well, this is not, these, all these oils we mentioned are a problem in terms of Shabbat, in terms of lighting for your Shabbat candles, but they're not a problem for other things, and we're not concerned that you might come to stoke, you know, or, or move the fire around for the following things. If you put them in a medulla, so if either you make a bonfire out of them, whether it's to warm yourself up or whether it's to use the light, okay, what's the issue? So we talked about the wicks before, that the wicks are, um, if you put the wicks together, right, then you're in a, the wicks, the issue with the wicks is that uh, the wicks don't light well, but if you have a midura, a bonfire, then you're going to have a lot of wicks together, and then they're definitely going to light well. Ben al gabe karka, it doesn't matter whether it's on the ground, or it doesn't matter whether it's in a kira, in a, in a um, burners type thing that they have. The loa through elala so mehem ptila linear bilvat. 
The main problem is making them a wick for a candle specifically. Okay. The Loba Shem and Kik. We're continuing along. Again, the issue we talked about yesterday was that the Mishnah was written in Israel and the Gemara already were in Babylonia and the rabbis don't necessarily know all the words that they use, so they're trying to figure out what are all the things mentioned in the Mishnah. So not Shem and Kik. My Shem and Kik, what is Shem and Kik? So we're going to have three answers for what Shem and Kik is. Amr Shmuel. Again, we have, he went down to the port because that was where the people knew different languages. And they told me, Okay, there's a type of bird, a bird that's in, that you can find by the sea, and it's called a ki, and that's, it's the oil that comes from that bird. It's cotton oil. Rishlakishamar, here's the one that's going to sound a little familiar to you, Kikayon di Yona. Okay, it's the Kikayon plant, which is a castor plant that is in the story of Yona. Now, if you remember the story of Yona, what happens at the end of the book? A Kikayon, right? God makes a Kikayon grow for him and then it dies right away and Hashem gets, and Yona gets very angry about it, right? Very upset. And then Hashem says, Oh, look at all the Rachamim you have in this Kikayon. And, you know, you didn't have any Rachamim on the people of Ninveh, which is, you know, that's how the book ends, basically. So here we have an interesting line. I'm a Rabbi Barbachana. So the first thing you need to know about Rabbi Barbachana is he was the third generation Amoraim. He was born in Bavel and then he moved to Israel um, to learn Torah. And when he went to Israel, he wandered into all different places. And he kind of, when he goes back to Babylonia, he tells all sorts of stories about things that happened when he was there. And he exaggerates. Okay, that's the other thing you need to know. You'll see the story is quite exaggerated. So he says, Ladidi Chazali Kikayon de Yona. I saw the Kikayon of Yona. Okay, now the whole Kikayon died. He obviously didn't see the Kikayon of Yona, but he means the Kikayon, I guess, that was with you, you know, the type of Kikayon of Yona. Litzluliva Dame. Okay, it's similar to in the Quran, they said Rainius tree or rain, Rainus, the Rainus tree. I don't know exactly what that is. Umidifashke Rabe. It, it grows by the swamps. Okay, so. What, what he's going to try to say is, this is an ama- like it's a very rich plant because it grows by all the swamps. Valpum chanuta madlan ligete, and they hang it in the entranceway of all the stores. Umi depart siduhu avde mishcha. From its kernels, we make oil. They make oil out of that. Ube anfohi naicham kol briche de ma'arava. All the sick people in Israel lie in its shade because it's, it's, um, its leaves are so big, okay? This is basically right. Obviously, it's exaggerating all the sick people, okay? We have this reference. It's interesting to all the sick people. That's about all we're thinking about these days, um, about protecting the sick people. And the, um, the Gaomi Vilna, he talks about the, the, what the Kikayon represents is wealth and that it's this overwhelming wealth, this, right, this idea of Yona that he thought, oh, you know, I have everything and it was about you know, where he was living comfortably and others not so. And uh, it's interesting, this reference that he's trying to say, right? Rabbi Baruch Han is saying this has everything in it. Um, and I was thinking it's interesting about the wealth that even though they're talking about this overwhelming, you know, this, this thing that's the ideal kikayon in the world, right? And then God takes it away from Yonah and it shows how things are very fleeting and they can come and they can go. And the second thing I was thinking about is that also when the what they're trying to show is when you have this overwhelming wealth, use it to help others, right? It's talking about how it would be used to protect the sick people. Okay. Now the Gemara is actually telling you explicitly, Rabbi tells you that the reason why we can't use these wicks is because the, the flame kind of flickers, okay? It doesn't stay solid. The oils that they said you can't light your candles with is because they're not, they're, they don't stay with the wick, okay? They're, they don't light well. This is what we said. There's two possible reasons as to what the issue is. Number one reason could be since they don't light well, you might shema yate. We have this concern again. What's shema yate? So in those days, right, they would have it in a, in a usually a klicheres, some earthenware vessel. They would put thinking of my kids when they were in Ghana, they always used to make these kind of candles where you would put oil in there and then you float the wick inside. Okay, so because the wick floats, it's not like our candles that we normally use, because the wicks float, 
that was the whole thing of the, the oil staying with the wick. If it didn't stay well within the wick, then you would have to kind of tilt. You might tilt, that's Shema Yaten. If you tilt it, you're actually causing the fire to be lit more. So that's an Isor for Shabbat. The other thing is if it doesn't light well, then it might burn out. And the issue is that the whole reason for the light is so that you have light on Shabbat. So if all of a sudden you don't have light, well, that's going to be a problem because we want to make sure people see and they don't bump into each other, they don't trip, all that. So therefore, these aren't um, oils that light very well. So now Abai asks Rabbi the following question. All these oils that the rabbi said we can't light on Shabbat, are you allowed to put some shemen in them, meaning some oil that you can use? Let's say I have a type of oil like this castor oil that I can't use. But if I put some olive oil in there, even a little bit, can I light it now? Because theoretically, maybe we'd say, well, that will help the, the it will help it to stay lit. Do we say, now they seem to think that if you add a little bit of some other type of oil, it'll actually light properly. So now they want to know, well, do we say we don't allow you to light with castor oil with a little bit of olive oil because we're worried that if we allow that, what will happen? We might end up lighting normally with just castor oil by itself. Okay, that's to light it by itself. Although, or maybe we don't make a So I'm a lay. So Rabbi says to him, no, we don't light. Okay, you can't light. According to Rabbi, you're not allowed to mix the oil with a little bit of some other oil and light. My time, oh, what's the reason? So if there's a funny answer, because we don't light. Okay, so that's, right, it's not such a clear answer what he means. So one way to read it is because what he really means is because we don't light with that oil by itself and therefore we make a gzera. Okay, we want to make sure that people don't mess things up. If you look in the Masorah Dashas, there's a little vav next to the word chain That takes you to the Masorah Dashas, if you have a regular Gemara. And it says there, Nuschaot acherot she'ein nidlakin. Okay, it says the reason is because they don't light well. Okay, so it could be he's saying these lights don't light well either. Now, it doesn't help that you put a little Shem and Zayat in them. They still don't light well. So basically, remember, Rabbah says, Abai asks Rabbah, can you mix the oils? And, Abai, and Rabbah says, no, you can't. So now, ATV. Now, Abai asks him a question for the following source. If you tie around or you put together something that you don't light with, with on top of something that you do light with, so far that sounds good. That sounds like Rabbah. But Rashbah Omer, Shabbat Abba, Hayu Korchim Ptila Al Gabe Egozu Madlikim. They would take the wick and kind of connect it with a nut. And they would light. Now, a nut is something that can't be used for lighting, right, for making a wick out of. So here you see an example. It's not the shmanim, it's about the patila of the wicks, but it's still the same kind of question. It seems like, according to Rashbag, one is allowed to mix them. So, Katani Miyarabai says, from this bright, what can you see? Madlikim, that according to Rashbag, you can be Madlikim. So, Amarle, so the obvious quest, the obvious retort of Rabbah is, you're questioning me from Rashbag, but I can bring my proof from the first opinion from the Tanakama. Because the Tanakama says explicitly my opinion that you can't mix. So, Halo Kashi Abai says, no, no, no. Don't, don't give me that kind of answer because Ma'aseh Rav. He says what? Look at the Mishnah. The Mishnah tells you, the Mishnah is not, I'm um, sorry, the Brayta is not exactly parallel. The Brayta starts off talking about um, Tanakama says, if you did this, right, but then Rashbag says, he doesn't say, yes, you can be Madlikimbo, like I disagree with you, but he tells him, he says in my family, right, in Beit Abba, they would do this. Now, whenever you hear an opinion versus a Ma'aseh, that they actually did something, the Ma'aseh is always stronger. Because if people actually did things that way, then that's your best proof that it's okay. Because lots of times people think things, but they don't necessarily act on them, right? Sometimes they're more lenient, they're more stringent, or some maybe even more lenient, right? But when they actually do something, that is all the more convincing. So Abayi says, if you're going to take that right, you're going to prove anything, you're going to prove what I'm trying, right, against what you're saying, which is Rashbag comes out much stronger. 
So now, remember, we this was the whole thing we started was a question. So the Gemara says, Mikomakom Kashya. So still, we're left with this question, if you're going to now say from Rashbag. My love lahadli. Now, isn't the indication here that they would be korchim the ptilo, they would put the ptila together with a nut, for what reason? Lahadli. It sounded like it was for the purpose of making a wick, in which case, it's a problem against Rabbah. But the Gemara now says, lo lahakpot. No, it didn't mean lahadlik, it meant lahakpot. Okay, what is lahakpot? So look in Rashi. Rashi says lahakpot is, I'm trying to find the Rashi. Um, yeah, about halfway down the page. Lo hayu madlikim haegoz, ela somech ala aptila lahatsifa, shelo titba. What does that mean? The egoz wasn't used to make the wick. The egoz was used, again, if you imagine what I was talking about, like a utensil full of oil with the wick inside, and the wick might kind of sink down to the bottom and it won't be lit well. So the egoz was used, they would put a nut at the bottom. That would make the wick higher. Once the wick was higher, it wouldn't sink and it would light properly. So that's not a case of mixing two things together to make the wick. That has nothing to do with it. In which case, what Rashbad says has nothing to do with what Rabbah said, in which case Rabbah is fine because he still goes by the Tanakama. So then they say, well, e lahakpot, my time de Tanakama. But then you end up with this brighter that the first part, it doesn't really make much sense. Tanakama starts off and says, you can put together something that you light with, together with something you don't light with. And then Rashbad says, well, we used to put the, the nut on the bottom of the, of the, of the, of the um, utensil and to help the wick float. But then the first part has absolutely nothing to do with the second part and what's Tanakama talking about? So what do they answer? Well, we're going to fix up this source a little bit using what we call a chisur mechasra b'hachi katani, which means it's missing parts and add the following parts. And in fact, it's not two opinions like we thought originally. Kula rashbagi, the whole thing is said in the name of rashbag. And the chisur mechasra b'hachi katani. Chisur mechasra means it's missing words and hachi katani means this is the way it should read. Karach davar shemadlikimbo, al kabeh davar shem madlikimbo, em madlikimbo. Okay, so far that's the same. If you put these two things together, you can't light with it. Bamed varim amorim. Here comes the added words. In which case are they referring to? Lehadlik. When we when we're actually lighting with them, to, we're using them to make the wick. Aval lehakpot. But if you're using it to float the wick, then mutar. Then you can have two things. One that lights well, which you used for your wick, and one that doesn't light well, which you're using for floating purposes. And then, how do they prove it? Ah, they're going to prove it from a maaseh. Sherabang gamliel omer, shabet abba, hayu kochim ptila al gabe egos. Okay, there you have it. Okay, we're now three lines from where the lines get wide. Ini, is this really true, what Rabbi said, that you can really, you can't mix two different things? Aha, marabrona, marav. Okay, yeah. The first question we had against him, Abai, brought from this Brita. In the end, we reread the Brita, and the Brita doesn't create a problem. Now we're going to say there's an Amora who says in the name of Rav, Chelev mihutach, v'kirbei dagim shenimochu. Okay, you have this um, fatty substance from the animal that you heat it up, v'kirbei um, dagim, and the innards of the fish that you melted. Okay, so both of these are kind of this liquidy that comes out, the liquid that comes out of them. Adam no tena to choshem and kosher umadlik. You can add a little bit of oil to this and you can light. So what does this sound like? It must be the chelev and the kirbei dagim are not things that we normally light with. However, if you mix them with some other oil, it's okay. So sounds like a problem against what Rabbi said. So now the Gemara answers no. These two things, the chelev mehutah and the, shem, the dagim shenimochu, the kirbei dagim, are somewhat different. Okay, what are they? These actually can light well. So if they can light well, why do you need oil mixed with them? So we'll get to it in a minute. But the other ones that we, the rebel was talking about can't be lit on, they don't light well on their own. Um, because the chelav mehutach and the kirbei dagim shenimochu have something that's similar to them that can't be lit. So if you have chelav that you didn't do this process to, and you have the kirbei dagim that you didn't melt, that can't be used for lighting. Therefore, they said you also can't use these. However, if you mix them with oil, then we already allow it. 
So now the Gemara is going to ask, the ligs or nami, but then why don't we say the same thing? Just like regular chalev, you can't, um, you can't mix with oil. So also, right, remember why we can't mix them with oil. What did he say? We can't mix them with oil. Gzeira, maybe you'll use it on your own. So since these things can't be used on their own either, theoretically, one should also say you can't use them mixed with oil. So what are the answer? Right, the lids are not mechelav mehutaf the kerei dagim shenimochu shenatan letochan shemen mishum chelav mehutaf the kerei dagim shenimochu shelo natan letochan shemen. Again, what we started with chelav, regular chelav, and regular kerei dagim. Then we said, right, those are forbidden no matter what because they don't like well. Then we took the next two. We said, well, those are forbidden because those are forbidden. And then we say, like, transitive property. Well, if those are forbidden because those are forbidden, and the original ones that are forbidden can't be used with oil. Even if the right, even if it's mixed with oil that can be lit, then these two also shouldn't be mixed for the same reason. So what's the obvious answer of the Gemara? He um, We don't take once we already forbid this because of that. We then don't say, well, it's also forbidden because you might come to. We don't do exera on something that was already because of exera. So again, we have these two oils that are different that actually can be lit but since they're similar to things that can't light well therefore we don't allow them but we allow them if we mix them with oil because that would already be exera on exera okay we're getting very close to hanukkah candles okay so pre- be prepared tane rami barhama ptilot shmanim shamru chachamim eim adlikim behem b'shabat eim adlikim behem b'mikdash mishum shenemar lahalo near tamid so now we say ah all the things that we talked about Shabbat are also relevant in the Beit HaMikdash. For what in the Beit HaMikdash? For lighting the menorah, we assume, okay? Because the no- menorah has to be lit. It says, Laha'alot near Tamid. So because it says, Laha'alot, what do we learn? Hu Tanela, Hu Amarla. Ta- Rami Brahama brought this bright and then he explained it. Kedesh shall have it olam eleha, that the flame comes up on its own. Velo sheteh olal davar acher, and not some sort of flame that needs help. Right? And all these oils, we already said, don't light well, and they would need some sort of help. Tanan. Miblai mechnesei koanim umehem nehem hayum afkiim umehem madlikim. Okay, there's a mission that talks about what they would do in the Simcha Pera Shoeva, and they would light all these menorot, and they would do them in the Beit HaMikdash. And it says, how would they light them? Well, how would they make wicks? They would take, this is a good example of when something has sanctity, you don't want to remove it from its sanctity, but it's no longer good. Like we have the clothes of the Kohen Gadol, all the old clothing that were worn, the, not the Kohen Gadol, just the regular Kohenim. The clothes were worn out. So what would we do with them? We didn't want to just use them for anything. So they would make wicks for them in order to light them in a lot in the Simcha Beit HaShoeva. It was the, the festival that they had on, on Sukkot, the parties that they made. So they would light all these candles in menorot in the Beit Hamikdash, not in the menorah if it was inside the hechal, but they had all these menorot that they would light. So here you see that they used. Now, what what did they use? Their clothes were made of wool. So here you see they used wool for wicks. And if you remember yesterday, I don't know if you remember this. It's hard to remember all these details. But at the end, of, toward the end of the Gemara that we learned yesterday, it said that they added to the list of all the things in the Mishnah that you also can't use. Uh, wool. They said wool and hair. Maybe the hair you remember more than the wool. At least for me, it was easy to remember because the thought of burning hair, right, and it burns quickly, but also wool. So what do they answer? Simcha uh, shoeva That's not the same. Simcha pera shoeva was not the same as lighting the menorah. It doesn't say lahalot near tamid. doesn't have that issue. Therefore, we can light that with this kind of wood. Tashma. Now they bring another source. Titani rabba barmatna vigdei kuna shebalu. They would take these old, again, they would say the same um, clothing of the Kohen Gadol, they, or the, the regular Kohenim, they would take, once they got worn out, and they would make wicks with them for the Mikdash. My love to Kilayim, now doesn't it seem like, and we know the co- some of the Kohen Gadol, uh, or the regular Kohen's clothing, was Kilayim. It was made from wool and linen mixed together. Um, so they say, there you have it again. You see these wicks and you see they made it with wool and it just says specifically for the Mikdash, which sounds like for the menorah. So they say, lo debuts, no, we're talking about the ones that were only made of linen. Okay, and therefore that's not an issue. Okay, getting to the big Hanukkah sugya. We're starting today, this will continue on for a few dapim. Um, this is the only section the Gemara really, it's mentioned in other places, we'll actually see, it's mentioned in the Mishnah in Babakama that we'll finish with today, but 
Um, this is the main place where Hanukkah is discussed there. It's a very tangential issue. Um, so here goes. Amar Rav Huna. Ktilot l'shmanim shamru chachamim eim adikim b'em b'shabbat, eim adikim b'em b'chanukah, b'em b'shabbat, b'em b'chol. The wicks and the oils that we say can't be used for Shabbat also can't be used for Hanukkah. We're going to see, by the way, three opinions about this. We might say there'll be only two, right? There's yes, you can use them, or no, you can't use them. But we're going to see that there's actually three. Okay, we'll get to how we do that. Okay, you can already see, right? It says, whether it's Shabbat or whether it's Chol. So now we're going to see how you get three opinions, because one is going to distinguish between Shabbat and Chol. You'll see why in a minute. My time at the Rav Huna. What's his reason why you can't use the same uh, oil? And here you might be surprised by this. Kasavar he held kavta zakukla. If the Hanukkah candles go out, and this is so surprising, but the second one's going to be more surprising. If the Hanukkah candles go out, you have to relight them. Meaning it's not just a mitzvah to light them. The mitzvah is to have them lit. Okay, we'll see later how much time is the mitzvah to have one lit, but have them lit. So therefore, if they burn out, you have to relight them, which means you can't use oils or wicks that aren't going to light well because you'll have to relight. And one is allowed to use the light. So therefore, it's going to be a problem also, right? I mean, this is a problem in any case because you want them to light well. But even if you say, okay, I'll relight it, but because, well, well it's not so connected to that, but because you want, you're allowed to use the light, therefore, specifically on Shabbat, it's going to be a problem because if you use the light, and then we're going to have that whole problem, Shema Yate, if it's not good oil. Rav Chiska Amar, Madlikim Bahem Bechol, Avalo Shabbat. He distinguishes between every day and Shabbat. Why? Kasavar, he's going to hold like part of what he said, but not all of it. Kasavar, Kavta, Ein Zakukla. If it goes out, you don't have to relight. So therefore, it doesn't matter on a regular day. You can use any oil you want, because if it goes out, it goes out. As long as you did the mitzvah of lighting, you're fine. However, you're allowed to use the light. Okay, this is funny because we always think, right, you can't use the light of Hanukkah. It's so obvious, but we learned here that it wasn't so obvious. In fact, two out of the three opinions say you're allowed to use the light for the Hanukkah candles. So since you're allowed to use the light, it's specifically a problem on Shabbat, not on a weekday. He says, all the oils and the wicks that you can't use on Shabbat, no problem. Use them on Hanukkah. On Shabbat, on Chol, it's not a problem. You can already guess why he's going to say this. Because I'm Rabbi Yirmiya, my time at the Rav. What's the reason for Rav? Rabbi Yirmiya says, Kasavar, Kavta, Ein Zakukla. Once it goes out, you don't have to relight it. So therefore, this, the quality doesn't have to be a great oil. And you're not allowed to use the light. So since you can't use the light, there's no problem on Shabbat. So here comes our interesting part. So now they all wanted to understand Rav's opinion, which is interesting to us. Rav's opinion is the most obvious because that's what we Paskin like. But in those days, it was obvious. It wasn't necessarily clear that that's how they held. And he wanted to understand his reason. So he says, so the rabbis, said before Abaye, Mishmei de Rabbi Yirmiya. The rabbis brought Rabbi Yirmiya's explanation before Abaye, Velo Kibla, and he didn't like his explanation. Ki ata Ravin, when Ravin came, Amarua Rabbanan Kamei de Abaye, Mishmei de Rabbi Yochanan. Then the rabbis brought Abaye's opinion in the name of Rabbi Yochanan. Now, why was Ravin important? If you remember, he was one of the people that goes back and forth from Israel to Babylonia, and he brought them the Torah of, of, Rabbi, Yir, of Rabbi Yochanan. Now, Rabbi Yochanan was more prominent than Rabbi Yirmiya, Vikibla. Now, once he heard the exact same thing, but now he heard it in the name of Rabbi, Yer of Rabbi Yochanan instead of Rabbi Yermia, then he was willing to accept it, right? This is indicative of what many of us do, right? Depending on who says it, you say, oh, that person said, well, I don't know that person, or I don't have enough respect for that person. I'm not going to accept it. But when you hear the exact same thing by someone worthy of respect, more in your mind anyway, right? You see a little bit about who Abaye respected and who he didn't. Then he accepted it. And then he said the following thing, Amar, if I had been Zoche, if I had married it, I would have learned this a long time ago, right? I would have heard this earlier, and maybe he was almost knocking himself for not accepting Rabbi Yirmiya's interpretation. So then the Gemara says, Vahagamra, but in the end, he, he learned the answer, so what's, what's the difference? In other words, who cares? So, Nafgamina Legirsa de Yankuta. They say, things you learn when you're younger, right? Yankuta is when you're young. 
Things you learn when you're younger, you remember much better. And we all know our memory is going as we get older. We don't remember things as well. So things you learn when you're older, you know, it's hard to stick. And therefore, he preferred that he had learned it earlier and that he would have remembered it better. Okay, now comes the real meat and potatoes, I would say, of the Hanukkah soup. So now, and this is interesting how they get to this, okay? And we said, according to Rav, Kavta and Zakukla. If it goes out, one doesn't need to relight. So now the Gemara is going to say, this seems to contradict a Tanaitic source. The Tanaitic source says, Mitzvata, the mitzvah of the candle, lighting Hanukkah candles, is Mishetishka Chama, it's one of my favorite lines in the Gemara because it's one of these things that has a million interpretations, right? You can see already that I like whenever there's lots of interpretations, right? What all the words in this mean, okay? What does it mean the mitzvah is? What does it mean once the sun sets? Is it the beginning of sunset? Is it the end of sunset? And what is right? Which means until the feet come back, right? Until the feet stop coming back from the marketplace. So we're going to have to explain what all these things mean. But right now, what the Gemara mean, thinks it means, okay, they're going to focus on the word mitzvata. Mitzvata, my love, di'i chabta, hadar madlikla. Doesn't it sound like it's saying the mitzvah is from the time that the sun sets until the last people come back from the shuk, meaning the lights have to be lit that entire time, right? That's the span of time of the mitzvah. It has to be lit from then to then meaning if it goes out before the last people get back from the shuk, you have to relight it. Isn't that what it means? Which would then contradict the what we explained about Rav, that if it goes out, you don't need to relight it. So now the Gemara gives two answers. Now I want to just tell you something structurally, because it's a very interesting sugya in terms of halacha lamasa and how we paskin. We brought a contradiction, and we're now going to resolve it by giving two possible suggestions about how to read that source. Now, if you have a source that has two possible suggestions about how to read it, the question is, do we say, okay, well, we have two possible suggestions. Now, remember, they're kind of put up against a wall and they say there's a problem, so they give two answers. Now, when they give two answers, did they mean this is la halacha, and then, this is now how you read that source, and therefore we pask in this way? Or is it that maybe this is right, and maybe this is right, and maybe we don't pask in like either, or maybe we pask in, you know, at a, maybe out of Suffolk or, you know, this, how do we view this when it gets to Pesach Halacha? And this is going to be very relevant for Pesach Halacha because you're going to see that the two most important Halacha to know about Nero Hanukkah come out of here. And there's a big debate among the Rishonim about, do we pask in this way all the time? Sometimes, do, are, there, are there ways that we can sometimes not necessarily pask in this way? How do we view this? And also what they mean is a whole debate. So we'll get into that. So, um, is it not that? So they say, no, no. De'i lo adlik madlik. What does it mean? The mitzvah is It means that if you didn't do it, the mitzvah starts at and your range of time that you could possibly do the mitzvah like Hanukkah candles ends at when tichle regal menashuk. And that means basically you're supposed to light around sunset. We'll talk about, right? So then there's a debate sunset, beginning of sunset, or end of sunset. Okay, that's another debate, which is why we generally light at the end of sunset, when the three stars come out, but there's Minhag Yerushalayim to light from earlier, right, from uh, sunset itself. Um, but the point is, if you didn't do it then, you still can do it later, but you can't do it once, right, which we now know nowadays, we're not so careful about this, right, people light even later, and some people say that's because this is only one of the answers given, since there's another answer, so theoretically, if you miss the time, you're allowed to light later, some people might say, well, is much later nowadays, right, there is no such thing, and some people say, based on later on the daf, we're going to see that when in time of Sakana, they would just light their candles inside, since you see that you don't necessarily need the Prusuminista, so therefore you can also light it later, right? Obviously the time frame is because we want the maximum number of people to see it. The Inami, the second interpretation is, maybe the words, is how much oil one needs to put. When you light your candles in the beginning, you have to put the amount of oil that will last from the time of Shkia until the time that people go home from the Shuk which by the way, there's the famous Grise, the uncle of the, the Rav, who lived on Rechov Strauss in, in uh, Yerushalayim, right opposite the Edison Theater. And he writes 
that he would put enough oil in his candles that would last till 11 o'clock at night when the last people would come out of the last movie. Okay, in those days it was 11. And because of that, he would leave that much oil. Okay, he paskin like this, literally, and that also changes over time, right? What it was then, because according to all the sources, this time period is half an hour. And that's why all our candles are half hour candles, other than, you know, now they make nicer ones for the longer and for Shabbat, you need longer ones. Because again, for Shabbat, it has to last. You light earlier because of candle lighting. And it has to last, again, till which is about half an hour after Tzedek HaChavim. But again, nowadays, one might say that's a much longer time period. So if you really hold, L'shiure means how much oil one needs to put, then nowadays you might have to be machmir like the Greece and put a really long, put it really long, again, depending on where you live and how many people walk around your street uh, past a certain time of night. Okay, so now this Ashtachle Regem so the Gemara didn't know what this means. The Ad Kama, they try to figure out how long is this. Okay, now this is their interpretation, which again, we look at it and say, oh, that doesn't really help us, but it obviously helped them, which is until the, the, the um, Tor Muda'im, which some people say was the nation, some people say it was just people, somehow what, all the interpretations connect to people who sell wood because they're the last people in the shuk, because what happens, everybody comes home, and then they realize, I don't have enough wood to burn my fire for cooking and for lighting in my house, so they go back to the shuk to buy, and then, because of that, they, um, they're they the last people in the shuk. Um, again, there's a few different interpretations, but we'll stick with that. Tanu Rabbanan, another very famous sugya, mitzvah Hanukkah near Ishu Beto. What's the mitzvah of Hanukkah? One candle in everybody's house. That means one candle every night, that's it. If you want to do the mitzvah even better, then you light every night one candle for each member of your family. So if you have six people, every night you're lighting six candles. And if you want to do even more, the first day you light eight, and every day you go down. And this is what we do. Every day you add another one. Uh, there's a very interesting machlok at Tosfot and Rambam and how to understand this. Is mahadrim mina mahadrim building on the mahadrim, which is what we do, which is that's Tosfot, that everybody lights in your family and everybody lights an extra candle every night. But the Rambam actually holds, no, this is instead of either you do mahadrim, which is everybody lights one candle, or you do mahadrim mina mahadrim, which is you light one chanukiah and every night you add. And that there's no need to do every person lighting every night adding candles. Um, it's interesting that in this halacha, right, it became the norm. The mahadrim and amadrim became the norm. Now we're going to see the reasons behind Beit Shammat Beit Hillel. There's a machloket about what the reason is. Amar Ula, pligi batchayam ohai. B'ma'arava. There's two amoraim in Eretz Yisrael who disagree about this. Rabbi Yossi bar Amin, Rabbi Yossi bar Zvei. Chan amar tama de Beit Shammai keneged yamim hanechnesim. The tama de Beit Hillel keneged yamim hayotzim. You're counting, according to Beit Shammai, the days that are left. Right? You're at eight, seven, six, five. That's how many days are, are, are about to come. And according to Beit Hillel, you're counting how many days have passed, right? We're, we're at one, we're at two, we're at three. The Chag Amar, Tama de Beit Shammai, Keneged Pare HaChag. The Tama de Beit Hillel, the Malim B'Kodesh Ve'en Moridi. Beit Hillel is very easy to understand, right? We always go up in sanctity, so we add every day another one, right? We don't want to start off big and then diminish. But according to Beit Shammai, it's a very strange reason. It's because of the parim that we have in the korban of Sukkot. Every day, that, if you remember from, we say it in the davening, every day it's a different korban, and it gets, there's 13 parim that we bring, and every day, then it's 12, then it's 11, then it's 10, and that's all together. There's 70 people say it's going the 70 you won't. Sukkot is this holiday, everybody comes to the band of death. So with there, every day it gets lower, right, less. So one reason is, well, it's just he's bringing it because what does this have to do with Hanukkah? So one says he's bringing it as like a precedent. We see there with Korban. No, likewise here. But in Sefer HaShemona, it talks about how on that year they didn't, they didn't celebrate Sukkot because of what was going on. And that Hanukkah was a way of kind of making up Sukkot. It explains also possibly the eight days, like in Sukkot. And so it could be that there's some connection there that Beit Shammai is connecting it with because that year they missed Sukkot, so this is connected to Parim that they didn't do. 
Okay. Amar Rabbi Rabbi Hana, Amar Rabbi Yochanan. Okay, there's a lot to say about that machlok, and I'm sure if anybody goes to any Yom Yom before Hanukkah, that's usually what they discuss, because there's not that much discussed in the Gemara about Hanukkah, and therefore, probably that's a topic that you've heard of a bunch of times. Amar Rabbi Rabbi Hana, Amar Rabbi Yochanan. Shnei zkenim ayu b'tzidan, echad asa ke beit shamay, echad asa ke nivrei beit hilel. Okay, one did like beit shamay, one did like beit hilel, zen o ten tam litvarav kineged for echad. So what do you see here? Each gave their reason, and the reason matched the second opinion and not the first opinion. What's interesting about this, some people say, how could they have held like Beit Shammai? This was in the time of the Amoraim. Already it's clear we always hold like Beit Hillel. So one of the answers given is that we hold like Beit Hillel when it comes to halachic issues. But this isn't a halachic issue. This is a hidur issue. To make the mitzvah nicer. It's not halachic. So therefore, one could hold like Beit Shammai, potentially. You're supposed to put it near your entrance of your house, outside. If you live upstairs and you can't do that, so you put it in the window that faces the, the public, the street. This is what I made reference to before. When you can't light Hanukkah outside because it's dangerous, you can just leave it on your table and that's sufficient. Amarava, right? This is all because we want to make everybody see about the nasa, it's called Pursumi Nisa, to make it known, and we can't do that when uh, when we can't do it, so we can do the mitzvah even without it. Amarava, Sarich ner acheret lishtamesh lohra, you need another candle in order to use the light. If you want to use the Hanukkah candles, so you have to have another light. This is why we put a shamash, so that you can use the light from there and not from the Hanukkah candles. But if you have a midura, lo tzarich. Okay, this, by the way, would be like if in our houses we have light, theoretically you don't really need a shamash, according to this. But if he's an important person, even if he has a midura, tzarich ner acheret, because an important person, the assumption was he wouldn't use a midura, he would use the candlelight to light his, I guess the midura was probably used for warming things. So if you have something used for warming things, right, and if you're poor or you're not so important, so you would use the light there to read, but if you're important, you would use a separate candle, and therefore um, he would use Hanukkah candles, and therefore you need your extra shamash. Okay, another very famous sugya of Hanukkah, my Hanukkah, right? What is Hanukkah? So, Detano Rabbanan, and now they're going to quote from Megillah Ta'ani. We talked about this the other day. It was the book that Hanan Ben Chizkiah put together. He was the guy with the attic, and he put it together because he wanted to make a list of all the days that you don't fast and you don't make a spading. They were happy days for the Jewish people. And what it's listed there, Kapeh B'Kislev, our day, right, of Hanukkah. Yomei de Hanukkah. These are the days of Hanukkah, Timnaya, they're 18 inun. Delo, right there, those are eight days. Delo le mispeh b'hon, delo le tanof b'hon. You can't have a husband, eulogize, you can't fast. Kishinich nesu yivanim lehechal, because when, now he explains what's the reason, and notice what's missing here. When the Greeks came into the hechal, tim u kol ashmanim, they made all the oils impure, that were in the Hechal, right? that's the inner room in the Ben Mikdash, where the menorah was kept. And when they found, right after they won the war, it said they only found one small pach of shemen, one small jar. Right, that had the seal of the Kohen Gadol, that it was basically sealed and therefore it didn't become impure. Okay, and it could only light for one day. So after that, kavum the next year, kavum ba'asum yamim tovim ba'haler ba'hoda'a. Okay, so what do you see? Ah, they made this big holiday. What was the reason? The nes pachashem, and it doesn't mention at all the miracle of the battle, right? And that they won the war. Rabim biyam matim, right? As we say in Alanisim, that it was right. Few beat out the many. Doesn't say that at all. Much is written over this. We'll move on though. Here we quote the Mishnah Baba Kama. If you have a spark that comes out of your hammer while you're hammering down, right? Imagine those workers who always walk by and there's sparks flying out everywhere. So if that goes out and damages, you're responsible. Gamal Shata'um Pishtan, if you have your camel, which is carrying flax on it. And what happens? The flax gets into the doorway of a, of a store, and it lights on fire from the fire of the storekeeper. And it starts burning something down. 
Baal Hagamal Chayav. So the owner is responsible because he shouldn't have let his camels flax get into the airspace of the of the store, right? Into the the door of the store. But he near chembani and Yerobi machutz. But if the chembani puts his candle outside, which is not a normal way to do things, chembani chayav. Then the chembani becomes responsible because he shouldn't have left his candle out there. What does this have to do with anything? Huh? Rabbi Yehuda Omer Bener Chanukah Patul. Well, when it's time for Hanukkah candles, since everybody puts their candles outside, if you walk your camel through the main thoroughfare and it lights on, the flax lights on fire from Hanukkah candles that were expected to be outside, then it's your fault as the owner of the camel. You should have known that the fire would be there. So Amar Ravina, and this is why they brought it here, Zoto Merit, from here you can learn another halacha about Hanukkah candles. Ner Hanukkah mitzvah lahanicha bitoch hasara. It must have to be within 10 tvachim of the ground. Why? If we could put it at a very high spot, then you should, you could, the owner of the camel could say to the owner of the store, it's your fault. You should have put your hot candles high up. You know you're in a public street and people are walking by. It's your fault, right? This is what we call people are always responsible for their act. The question is, though, there's two people responsible here. Who's more responsible? The Bala Gamal for putting it where he put it, or for walking the camel through without being careful, or the owner for putting it where he put it. If he has no choice but to put it within 10 Tvachim of the ground, then it's obviously not his fault. So therefore, they say, since it's so clearly not his fault, it must be that he has to put it low down. So now the Gemara rejects this, and this is our last line for today. The Dilma imitracha lechuva ati imnuemi mitzvah. It's obviously easier to put things lower down than it is to put things high up. If you put things very high up and we require the storekeeper to climb up and put something higher up, he may not do the mitzvah because it's too big a headache. That's why we allow him to do it lower and we make the bala gamal chaya. But it doesn't mean that you actually have to put it ten shpachim, within ten shpachim of the ground. However, there are many people who are mocked on the salacha, it's quoted about the height of your chanukiah has to be low down. Um, okay, that's it for today. Um, the Shabbat daf, I'm hoping to record it today and put it up later today. So see if I manage to do that. Um, okay, so you can look today uh, and I'll post it in the WhatsApp group so you'll know it's up. Okay, Shabbat Shalom, everyone. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat shalom. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you. Shabbat Shalom. Thank you.